The city of London was exploding into life. Bells in the hundreds of churches across the city rang out in sheer joy as the people of London came to the streets to drink wine that poured from public fountains, to dance, to celebrate the accession of a new king. It was the first peaceful and easy transition of kingship in almost a century. The new king was young, smart, a modern man in every way and a symbol of a new golden age. But one man could not celebrate. This man had been a loyal public servant to the previous, now deceased, king. He had been an MP, a lawyer, a taxman, and even served as Speaker of the House of Commons. But now he was locked in a cold cell in the most forbidding of fortresses, the Tower of London. And not many who walked through the gates of the Tower walked back through again unscathed. The policies to which the prisoner had given his life had been unpopular, and the new king would find someone to blame as a signal of a start of a new regime. Still, the prisoner held some hope that he might be redeemed. As he waited for his fate, pardon or execution, he began a work of political philosophy to try and please his new monarch. The work supported absolute monarchy and a unique political idea utilised by the king's saintly Lancastrian great-uncle. The book, The Tree of Commonwealth, was a unique work from Edmund Dudley, a tax collector and vital cog in the wheels of Henry VII's government. Dudley probably knew that his new king, Henry VIII, wasn't going to pardon him. In fact, Dudley was executed a year after Henry's coronation in 1510. But his book survived, and it stands as a fundamental document to anyone trying to understand the Tudor period. It is a key insight to the social values of Tudor England and their political philosophy, that of Commonwealth. In his work, Dudley saw the state where he lived and the principle that guided it as an immense tree. A tree can grow, it can support life, it can strengthen over time. The tree of Commonwealth is supported and nourished by four roots. A love of God, justice, trust, and concord. While the roots prosper, the tree can produce delicious fruits that provide for the community. Fruits of tranquility, worldly prosperity, the honour of God, and of good example. Dudley sought to review or renew the Commonwealth within this his realm, the which long time hath been in sore decay, but my full purpose, prayer and intent is that all things well ordered may so continue and increase to the better. Okay, so we know what creates the Commonwealth and what fruits it produces, but what even is a Commonwealth? For those in modern Britain, there's a particular and distinct whiff of the lingering odour of imperialism, but that's nothing to do with how the Tudors understood the term. It was THE buzzword of Tudor politics, and it could mean a whole lot, and it could also mean nothing. It could refer to the workings of government, or how it enacted policy. It could mean public welfare, concerns for the common interest, a move away from monarchy, and loyalty to an absolute ruler. The Commonwealth mattered a lot to the Tudors. They spent a lot of time arguing about it, defining it, pondering how it should work, trying to make it work. And to understand how a Tudor saw the world, you'll have to understand what Commonwealth meant to them. Commonwealth, the greater good. You should be ashamed. Calling yourself a community that cares. Oh, but we do care, Nicholas. It's all about the greater good. The greater good. How can this be for the greater good? The greater good. The Tudor idea of Commonwealth was synonymous with classical ideas of republic. The word Commonwealth, or Commonweal if you speak early modern English, is derived from a really rough translation of republic. So, res publica, the state and the public, as the commune of England and Wheel as well-being, so commune, wheel, public well-being, really rough translation. The Tudor common wheel was understood to refer both to the governance of the state, what you would call polity and what I'll call polity from now on, and with the common good, which essentially meant actions taken for the benefit of the majority. 
Thomas Smith in 1583's The Commonwealth of England defined the commonweal as a commonwealth is called a society or common doing of a multitude of free men collected together, united by common accord and covenants among themselves for the conservation of themselves as well as in peace as in war. So as a modern person, it's possible to see commonwealth theory as being this strange hybrid mixture between utilitarianism and contractualism. A Tudor would argue that the governance of the state should provide for the well-being of the commons of England by providing justice, security, spiritual welfare, all that jazz, and also that it was dictated and controlled by the social duties that the different classes owed to each other as part of the hierarchical structure that people were born into through the perfect creation of God. All members of Tudor society had a duty as part of a well-functioning state to behave and act in a manner that would provide for the welfare of their wider community. And the state did not just mean, well, the state. The country of England is the public household, but the private household, so homes, businesses, guilds, just about anything else, also had to be run by Commonwealth terms. All classes in society, from gentlemen to burghers and citizens to merchants to priests to yeomen and to those able husbandmen at the bottom of the pile, had their role to play in the function of society and to ensure the welfare of those around them through social and religious duty. The sheriff, the housewife, the guildmaster, the monarch or the laundress was tasked to uphold the welfare or common good of their subjects as their first priority. It was their duty to provide, you know, Security, order, economic well-being, spiritual salvation, justice, peace, you know, all the good stuff, and only undertaking actions and polity that would be most conductive to the betterment of their realm. The ultimate purpose of Commonwealth philosophy was to provide the conditions so that people of the state could live a life of virtue, content in their role and duties, loyal to the state, and confident in the hope of salvation hereafter. Why are people invested in monarchy or so invested in republicanism? The Tudor Commonwealth demanded that people be loyal absolutely to their absolute monarch, a monarch with supreme power not limited by law, justified by the idea that their monarchship was divined and decided by God. But yeah, the idea of Commonwealth is based on the classical Roman idea of republic, itself inspired by Greek democracy. The thing is that Tudor scholars worked in the world of humanism, not humanism as we would see it, about critical thinking, evidence, scepticism, normally atheism, but Renaissance humanism. And Renaissance humanism is about going back to the original texts of Western society, reading them in their original languages as part of this movement of revived classicism, where Greek and Roman ideas of morality, citizenship and religion were used to try and improve their society. A particular example of humanism might be Lorenzo Valla's work on the donation of Constantine. This was a document that was supposed to have been this imperial decree from Constantine the Great giving authority of the Christian Church to the Pope of Rome, so creating the authority of the Catholic Church. However, Valla's work proved the document was an 8th century forgery and that this fake work had corrupted the early purity of the Christian church, caused wars in Italy, and empowered the overbearing, barbarous, tyrannical, priestly domination, his words, not mine, indirectly laying the grounds for reformation and the eventual work of thinkers like Martin Luther. Humanism was big, important, groundbreaking, with scholars trying to decipher what made the ancient world just so successful, powerful, and philosophically dynamic trying to recreate the work of great thinkers from the past. Commonwealth was both directly and indirectly based on ancient thought. So bear with me. The origin of the idea is like a circle, so it takes some explaining. So strap into our chariot of philosophy as we go through the ages. The thinking and theory of common good can be traced back to classical Greece, Aristotle, big daddy of natural philosophy, discussed at length the idea of common interest. In his view, a good ruler should pursue the public interest and not their own. The public interest, the common good, is only attainable by the community, providing well-being in a manner that can be shared by all members. His teacher, the granddaddy of Renaissance thought, Plato, inspired these thoughts. 
Plato's ideal political order was one that promoted harmony from all different community groups. Through friendship and cooperation, they worked together to create social good. Then there's Cicero. Oh, Cicero, you little bench. Cicero, a Republican, not modern Republican, but classical ancient Rome Republican, wrote about the theories and ideals of res publica and res populi. He defined these as concerns or property of the people, where public means a community joined together through mutual agreement on law and community interests. He argued that res publica was a state founded on the consent of the people and run by officers on behalf of the res populi. The res publica was a healthy state because the interests of the public were paramount to the concerns of those in charge. The idea of res publica continued past the end of the Republic, into the Empire and beyond, lasting into the Christian world and the Empire, particularly in the works of Augustine of Hippo and his influential The City of God. This inspired other works throughout Christian kingdoms that came after Rome, especially in the derived works of St Thomas Aquinas, and then inspired the work of humanists who tried to apply the wisdom of the classical era by going back to the original texts of Aristotle and Plato in this you know, circle of philosophy we've gone on. Bishops inspired by humanist thought and St Thomas Aquinas used the term res publica in the 14th century to describe the well-being of the realm and it came to represent the political collectivity of the state as represented in England by Parliament, a government formed by the commons and nobility working together with the monarch, symbolising the working together and harmony of the community. Commonweal is like the 15th century version of big society, only successful, relevant, not destroying communities through austerity. Commonweal is the big phrase that the government of Henry VI wanted you to remember. That commonweal means common good and that the king and his government provided for their subjects as their priority above all else. They want you to know they provide for the community and for the individual. They provide security and social order. They deliver justice. They provide for the public based on the consent of those they govern. They are an absolute monarchy that works as an ancient republic of the classical world. The state of England is a monarchical republic in the eyes of some scholars, a polity of an absolute monarch, but which followed the structure and value of a republic. Commonweal as a term can mean everything and nothing all in one, an amazing work of political promotion, but it was a term that carried a huge amount of emotional weight for the people of Tudor England. For them, it was an emotive concept that enabled the pursuit of the common good and the interests of the people. Commonwealth was a tangible thing in the world, this philosophical entity that was there to pursue the common good and the welfare of all the people of all England. At least in theory. How did this work? What strange fancies prevail amongst this people? And how much their ideas differ from those of other nations, wrote the Venetian ambassador in 1555, a rather fitting way to introduce how the policy of Commonwealth actually tried to function in English society. It's all very well and good to have this philosophical theory of public good tied into classical ideas and republic and defence from tyranny and also supporting the doctrine of absolute monarchy, but how does that work in the day-to-day -day running of a country? Think back to the metaphor used for the Commonwealth that of a tree. To get a successful commonwealth, the monarch must guide the roots into providing the fruits that people want. But everyone must work together to avoid the deadly cause that can rot inside ill-cared-for fruit, the cause of illness, strife and conflict. The people of England are like the gardeners of the tree. The head gardener is the monarch. They've been given that job by a higher power and are supported by all their junior gardeners. Below the head gardener, the monarch, comes the clergy, the Lord's spiritual. Their job in the garden is to pray and provide for the souls of the commune of England, sustaining the values and moral requirements to keep God happy and provide for the salvation of the public after death. After the clergy, there is what Edmund Dudley called the chivalry. These are all those born gentle in blood, so your dukes, earls, barons, knights, esquires and bog-standard gentlemen. Their job is to serve the monarch, to govern the country in peace but be ready to defend it in war. Gentlemen should protect and relieve the struggles of the poor and weak. 
and create the conditions for such men to live good lives. And at the bottom of the pile, the composters, to keep this metaphor going, the rest of the lot anyway, what Tudor writers called the commonality. Lawyers, doctors, craftspeople, merchants, businessmen, and those labourers out in the fields doing hard work. Their duty is to work, to make a living appropriate for their God-given place in society, and to support the rest. They should avoid grudging and murmuring against the fact they were born to live in labour and pain and for the most part of their time in the sweat of their face. The central idea of the state, this great garden of England, was duty, harmony and order. This society is a community of different groups, all working to a duty and in a place given to them by God as part of the natural plan for the universe. Every person contributes to the function of society and each plays their part within the strict social class system. There's very little room for a composter to become, like, assistant gardener. Everyone in England knew their place and would never have been allowed to forget their place within society. Order was a vehicle of God, for the Tudors believed that all things were created and placed in a perfect order. As there is a hierarchy for the angels in heaven, a hierarchy for the beasts of the earth and for the stones of the soil, every human has been given their place in the social hierarchy. And as all authority ultimately derives from God, the never-seen landlord of the garden, everyone working there has to be obedient to the monarch, the head gardener, as it's pretty much the same as being obedient to God. The obsession with order comes from specific fears in the Tudor world. It's important to not forget that the Tudor world had been born from civil war, from a century of divisive and disruptive war that fractured society, isolated England from the rest of Europe, and prevented anyone from just getting on with it. The tiny wee baby economic destruction of capitalism was just starting to become a thing, which meant that social mobility wasn't a process of change. Men like Thomas Wolsey, Thomas Cromwell, Thomas Cranmer, all the Thomases born into the commonality could potentially rise up to work in the highest offices of the land. So it was no wonder that problems kept cropping up in the state when common men decide they can be gentlemen. The Commonwealth state was best served by maintaining a strict hierarchy where each social strata was subservient to the one above. As the homily of obedience says, Almighty God hath created and appointed all things in heaven, earth and waters in the most excellent and perfect order. In heaven he hath appointed distinct orders and estates of archangels and angels. In earth he hath assigned kings, princes with other governors under them, all in good and necessary order. Every degree of people in their vocation, their calling and their office have appointed to them their duty and order. Some are in high degree, some in low, some kings and princes, some inferiors and subjects, priests and laymen, masters and servants, fathers and children, husbands and wives, rich and poor. And where there is no right order, there reigneth all abuse, carnal liberty, enormity, sin and Babylonical confusion. There was a certain amount of push and pull as to what the extent of hierarchy, authority and potential for social mobility should be. B. The idea of commonwealth does imply that there should be no social hierarchy, and it does come directly from republican ideas. But the Tudor state needed its subjects to support and be loyal to an absolute monarch. But how far should monarchy be allowed to go? If the monarch is a tyrant and ignores counsel, should people still be loyal to them? For some, the public wheel meant that public property should be held in common by the people. It was an age of wealth inflation, land reform, the deterioration of rights held by the common people, particularly access to common land, as landlords began to enclose vast swathes of the countryside in the pursuit of farming sheep for financial gain. The rebels and protesters against the social order used the collective interests of the commons to explain their intent. The rebellions of the Tudor era often attributed Captain Commonwealth as their leader, showing their desire to maintain a common good, an attempt to uphold loyalty to the monarchy, and even the proliferation of political philosophy throughout the most base common people of England. The 1536 Fincham plotters aimed for the commonality would rise for the commonwealth, 
with the Commonwealth meaning the well-being of the common community, Ket in his rebellion sat underneath the tree of Commonwealth and reform. For some, this went even further. Hugh Latimer, a reformer and churchman, advised that things are not so common that another man may take my goods from me, for this is theft, but they are so common that we ought to distribute them unto the poor to help them and to comfort them with it. We ought one to help another. This republican idea of commonwealth and common good eventually came to be used to describe the English state after 1649 and the rule of parliament, binding the idea of commonwealth with the idea of rule of a republic, a state without a king or a house of lords, and now it means the community of countries that join together to play sports and commiserate about colonialism. But let's return back to the 16th century, when the ideas of parliamentary authority are just starting to develop and ridding the country of an absolute monarch is unthinkable. The Tudor world relied on communitarian ideas to function. Every person in this period lived within a complex web of networks and affinities. You would be linked through your kin. The land you lived on, the parish you came from, the economic interests you had, the patronage you gave and the patronage you expected. Any one of them could be linked to national polity and came with expectations and duties. The Commonwealth was a social idea that bound all subjects of England together as a community and held all in a semi-legal social obligation to fulfil their duties to each other and to the state. Tudor England was not an individualistic society. Instead, subjects were urged to contribute to the wellness of those around them and find purpose through their role in the healthy functioning of the state. Private interests must be subordinate to the interests of the community, for only a sinful subject will pursue his private desires to the detriment of the state. Even Edmund Dudley, who defined and explored the Commonwealth as he waited for his fate in a prison cell, fulfilled this purpose. He gave his life in loyalty to his king and died by the whim of another willingly giving up his life to fulfil the needs of the community and to submit to the authority of a king. Knowing the Commonwealth and the theoretical framework that underpins it is crucial to understanding the political and social world in which the Tudor Britain lived. You cannot understand the works they produced or the acts they did without knowing how they thought. So thank you for listening to my mini sort of episode on a the idea of commonwealth as a political philosophy um it's kind of important to understanding how the tudors saw and theorized about the world to understand anything about the tudors you kind of have to know how they think and this hopefully gives you a little bit of an insight into what they thought was most important um if you enjoyed it like share subscribe all that um I've got my bibliography up on here so if you want to investigate it more beyond this video I'd recommend any of these as sort of guides to where to start especially with social history. If you'd like to help me research more you can check out my coffee link down below. Um, I'm not sure what I'm going to do next. Uh, it might be about the world around um labor and giving birth but um i haven't really decided yet